curatorially, we're often charged with making some interesting decisions about how we want to represent our artifacts. Generally speaking, as Anders touched upon in other episodes, is when we have a known history of an airframe, we will generally pick a history from that portfolio, right? But occasionally we will get aircraft here um, that are really Franken airplanes or they're um, constituted out of new parts, refabricated parts. So in, in that case, when we don't really have a clean, clear, concise history, I mean, look, you could pick the history of an aileron and build a story around it too, right? Um, I don't know that we've done that, but what we've typically done is we've, we've done things like with the Bolingbrook behind us. Um, this came from Dave Talachet's collection and he had it in the yard at Chino after rescuing it from the uh, Western Canada and Manitoba in the early 70s. Uh, Dave harvested many, many airplanes over the years and his intention was always to fly things. So in the context of putting this airplane back together, they took all the best components and pieces to put together into a flyable aircraft, which means the aircraft behind us is constituted out of the bits and pieces of at least five different bowling brooks that we've been able to identify um, when, when we took it apart and brought it back here. So now most of your listeners know the, the bowling brooks in RCAF service were largely relegated to training detail and were all painted, you know, various shades of yellow or yellow and black and there's a lot of them interpreted in that way and and we took the decision that we were going to do something a little bit different and you know tell some of the lesser known stories of World War II. Uh, the Canadian Air Force operated many bowling brooks on the uh, west coast of Canada uh, out of uh, British Columbia on anti-submarine, anti-shipping patrols, surveillance patrols as well as the the training duties. So uh, after looking around, we picked this paint scheme, which represents uh, Bolingbroke 9118, uh, which was an operational aircraft on the east coast of Canada with 115 Squadron uh, at Annette Island in Alaska. Um, what was kind of fun about this story is uh, some evidence surfaced in the early 2000s that 9118 um, had conducted a submarine attack uh, on what they thought was a Japanese submarine and turns out with further historical research, not done by us, but by smarter people, um, <laughs> determined that in all likelihood they sunk a Russian submarine or possibly a whale. So you know, it, uh, it, it, it's kind of a colorful story of a fairly quiet theater of the war and um, it just allows us to broaden our reach and ties the aircraft into our Pacific theme hangar display. So another important airplane that we're fortunate here to have in the collection is our Curtis P-40E Warhawk. Now this is painted up as serial number 41 25 uh, and its nose art aptly represented here for our context is Arizona. So I'll let Andrew talk about why it's painted this way. Right, so this is another one of those Franken airplanes that came from lots of new build parts and parts that Rob Greinert and previous owners of this aircraft have gotten from places all over North America and Australia and this well, Alaska, in Alaska, <laughs> yeah. South Pacific, all of the above. So it's another aircraft that has no real identifiable history. So this is again where we get to talk about an interesting story. So this aircraft is a surprisingly well-documented aircraft from the very early stages of World War II in the Pacific. Um, it was an aircraft that was due to head to, to the Royal Australian Air Force and ended up going into American service, like a lot of aircraft at that point, because everyone was just kind of grabbing what was available. So Sidney S. Woods was assigned this aircraft and chose the name Arizona because he was from Arizona. He played football for the University of Arizona, and uh, he had this art commissioned with, the air, with this rattlesnake on it. Now, some people will notice that we have the same thing on both sides, but there's photos showing on the other side a rattlesnake that seems less complete and doesn't have Arizona on it. But when you look at the photos, you can see the cans of paint on the, on the ground on the other side. So it's quite clear that that artist was going back and forth using the paints to do the different colors simultaneously. So models and other recreations of this aircraft have always kind of showed it with two different types of snakes and only Arizona on one side. We, after looking at these photos, made the determination that that was incorrect. Right. You know, Sidney Woods had come out to check on the progress of the nose art that was going on his airplane that he'd probably parted with several bottles of premium booze for a, a talented ground crewman to represent. Um, 
When we did do the airplane, uh, my wife fortunately has artistic talent. She recreated the nose art for us. And just talking to her about the technique and the economy of working around doing this type of nose art, she says, yeah, you've mixed your paint, you've done your sketches, you are gonna work. It's not hard to work both sides simultaneously. So it really kind of confirmed um, our suspicion that you, know, you have to be careful about interpreting photographic evidence because right. all it all it tells you is what's happening at that specific right. point in time. It doesn't tell you before or after. So you kind of have to apply a little bit of, you know, a bit of reasoning to to your interpretation sometimes. Um, you know, Andy had talked about you know Sydney Woods' connection to Tucson. Um, you know, he was very prominent in the area area for many many years after the war. He was a regent at the University of Arizona. Uh, he later went on and flew in Northwest Europe, and I believe he was an ace in a day too. Right, there right, too, yeah. Right? He shot down, I believe, two Bettys and either is a zero in the Pacific, flying P-40s and P-38s. Then he did a tour in the in Europe with a P-38 unit and then went back and did a tour as a squadron commander with the P-51 unit, shot down five FW-190s in one day, and then got shot down and spent the last uh, couple months of the war as a POW, which was also a very hairy time for POWs as you know they were being forced to march and everything. But yeah, he, as Scott pointed out, he came back to Arizona, was prominent in you know, political circles and uh, Agriculture. Yeah, yeah, he owned a yeah. ranch and yeah. farm out in Yuma. Yeah. yeah, and he died of cancer in the 1980s. And, you know, he's really kind of unknown in our community and in the aviation community at large because, you know, I guess he didn't live long enough to do the uh, the air show circuit and the, the autograph circuit. So uh, we thought it was really appropriate for us to um, acknowledge his service and perpetuate his memory in our collection. Mm -hmm.